the long haul to the front. One day, there was the long-awaited news on the notice board. 0600, 11th of February, 1943. Regiment will prepare to move, etc., etc., etc. Great excitement. Packing, renewing kit, selling kit, buying fruit for the journey, writing farewell forever, etc., to sweethearts. The day before the move, I developed a toothache. It started at two in the morning. The pain shot up my head, down the back of my neck, and disappeared down my spine, then reappeared in my chest sideways up the tent pole. How could one tiny hole neutralize a whole man? Willpower. That's it, willpower. That would stop it. I did willpower till three o'clock. It got worse. Old wives' recipe. Stuffed tobacco into the cavity. I lit the lamp. Eddington woke. He saw what appeared to be Gunner Milligan splitting open cigarettes and poking the tobacco down his throat. Look, mate, he said, you're supposed to smoke them. Next morning I drove to the dental surgery in a villa on the sea at Cap Matifu. The dentist... A young, fair-haired captain sat me in the chair and drove his prodder down till it got through the collarbone. Oh! Sir, I said. You scream very well. Yes, I'm practising for the front line. I drove back with the left side of my face frozen dead. You may ask, what use is a half-frozen face? Well, it keeps longer. To this day, the left-hand side of my face is two hours younger than the right. We were to fill in our wills in the back of our army paybooks. I had no possessions, no money, two cheap fifty-shilling suits, a second-hand evening dress, a few Marks and Spencer shirts, and a mess of ragged underwear. My trumpet was my only bounty, so I wrote, I leave my trumpet to my mother and the eight B payments to my father. Others made lavish entries, Gunner White. I leave my gas stove to Sergeant Major so-and-so. To some it wasn't funny, Reg Griffin said, when millions of perfectly healthy young men have to make their wills out, there's something nasty in the world. This tea tastes funny, I said. It's bromide, said Gunner Devine. It stops you having improper thoughts while you're in action and caution you to lose your aim. What you saying, said Gunner Forrest, who was very, very dim. What I'm saying, said Devine, is that bromide stops you getting randy then there's no women about to be the recipient of your desires. The bromide had some effect. The onanists were much less active and we all got to sleep earlier. Gunner Moffat didn't like bromide. He was a Christian science monitor. He stopped drinking tea in case it interferes with my manhood. Mamadia Dean told him it was also in the food. So he stopped eating and lived on out of fruits. As a result, he got galloping dysentery and went down to seven stone before he was weaned back to bully beef. I don't think the bromide had any lasting effect. The only way to stop a British soldier feeling randy is to load bromide into a 300-pound shell and fire it at him from the waist down. Dawn, February the 11th, 1943. Yawning, I threw back the tent flap and felt the chill air run over me in the pre-dawn light. I hadn't been able to sleep. The excitement of the coming adventure had got to me. I had risen first, dressed, and started packing my kit. As the morning grew, my comrades started to stir. The odd voice commenced to break the silence in the camp. After breakfast, I loaded my kit onto the Humber Snipe wireless truck. At 8.30 a.m., the transport of the regiment was lined up pointing due east. Edgington, late as usual, was swearing. If I have to pack this bloody kit once more, I'll... I'll become affiliated to the Swanicles. You don't mean that dark, beauteous gunner, I said, wiggling me fingers. His kit back looked as though it had a dismantled gasometer inside. The squadron of Bell aerocoppers roared over. I hope you bloody will crash, I shouted instantly. Any luck, said Harry. No. Your power is waning. Rubbish, I said. I've got the lowest wane fall in the battery. Get out before I laugh, said Harry, pointing upwards. Driver Shepard and I were detailed to drive Lieutenant Button in the wireless truck. We had been standing by vehicles for an hour and nothing had happened. But it happened frequently. Dispatch riders raced up and down the column shouting, Fuck everybody! But well, that was all. We started to brew tea when Lieutenant Button's iron-framed glasses appeared round the truck. Look, damn you! I'm supposed to be standing by your vehicles. I'm sorry, sir. I'll say uh, three Hail Marys. Give me a cup and I'll say no more about it, he said, producing a mug from behind his back. Lieutenant Button flags down a Don R. What's the hold up? I tell you, sir, I'm the Don R who follows the Don R in front with a message that cancels out his message. A cloud of dust is approaching at high speed. From its nucleus, formidable swearing is issuing. It's our signal, Sergeant Dawson. 
Get mounted, we're off, it bellows as it goes down the line, followed by mocking cheers. Whey! I jumped in. Engines are coming to life. The hood is rolled back, so Lieutenant Budden can stand Caesar-like in the passenger seat. Shouts are heard above the revving of the engines. Right, Milligan, said Button. World War Two at 25 miles an hour. He looked back at the long line of vehicles. My God, what a target for the Luftwaffe. Don't worry, sir, I said. I have a verbal anti-aircraft curse that brings down planes. Keep talking, Milligan. I think I can get you out on mental grounds. But that's how I got in, sir. I don't be all. There was a throttle on the steering column. I set it to a steady 20 miles per hour. I said 25, said Button. Uh, sorry, sir. Trying to economise. The slower we go, chances are, by the time we get there, it might be all over. Oh, it will be all over, Milligan, he said. All over bloody Africa. We rolled along comfortably, the sun warm, scenery magnificent. We stopped for ten minutes every two hours to stretch our legs. I didn't stretch mine as they appeared to be long enough. At every halt, Arabs materialised from nowhere, bearing eggs, dates, and some long black things that looked like petrified eels or a model of Plunger Bailey's weapon. We pressed on, crossing the river Issa, a thick brown torturous winding affair flowing very fast. It kept company with us until we reached the village of Les Issa, a cluster of mud buildings. Outside a seedy white gendarmerie, an unshaven seedy off-white gendarme slumbered in his chair. He's, he's pretending the war isn't on, said Button. I shouted, Oi, monsieur le gendarme, où est le guerre mondiale nombre d'urks? He pointed up the road, avant six mille kilo. He grinned and fell back to sleep. Here is an excerpt from Major Chaterdak's letter of the time. Here I sit in a truck by the roadside. The country is all covered with olive trees, karoo beans and aloes. There are snow-capped mountains in the distances, and a deep, turbid, muddy river flowing to the centre of a broad, fertile plain. What growing country this is! There have been no vineyards for a long time. A few orange groves, but the crop is nearly over. Mostly Arabs about, herding flocks of goats and some cattle. Some French people in the first few days, but now an Italian strain is showing. That's funny, I never knew the Major was suffering from an Italian strain. 1300 hours, arrived village of Champ de Marchal. What marshal was it named after? Answer? At a railway siding, said Edgington. So it must be altogether Marshal Yard. Three out of ten, I said. We sat down to eat the unexpired portions of our rations. Unexpired being a piece of bully beef that is gradually dying for its country. I grabbed my throat, staggered round, gasping, This bully beef's poisoned with food! Ah! And fell to the ground. Bury me up a tree, I said. You bloody fool, said Edge, why? After I die, I want people to look up to me. Three out of ten, he said, placing one finger in his ear. Lunch over, and on to battle. Above, the sky was cobalt, cloudless. The jebel stood out in stark blue-grey in the clear light. On our left, the silt-laden waters of the Cebu thundered in a titanic gorge on its way to the Mediterranean. Donkeys with riders perched on their haunches were passing by and pulling more donkeys, almost lost to view under sacks of produce. The animals looked in a sorry state, but then so did the Arabs. We were nearing a large town with the champagne name of Tizi Uzu. What's that mean? asked student of Arabic Gunner White. It's an ancient Arab proverb, I said. No, it isn't, he said. It's a wog town. Let me explain, I said. It means the shadow of the razor falls directly under the ear roll of Mohammed, but it's cheaper by the pound. Get off, said Chalky in that brat direction. Where do you think of all that bloody crap? Any open space, I said. Outside Tizi Uzu, we pulled off the road among the groves of oranges. That night I slept al fresco, and there's nothing better except sleeping al jelson. <laughs> Next day, according to my diary, I sat in the back of the truck with a huge pink idiot youth from Egham. Who, I don't seem to be able to recall. Egham, yes. But him, no. But Egham, yes. Perhaps I was sitting in the back with a huge pink Egham. I was passing the time testing the wireless set when I got, This is the Allied Forces Network, Algeria. A stentorian American voice said, Here for your listening pleasure is Tommy Darcy and his orchestra. Great! I listened all day. I did up a cigarette. Now, this was more like war. A sign, Seek en Medou. Sir, I called a button. We've just passed a sign saying someone's been sick in the meadow. There was no reply. Just silence, but dear reader, it was a commissioned officer's silence. Of course, if you were a brigadier, you could command a brigade of silence. There's no end to it. I could feel it getting chilly at nights, and made a mental note where my balaclava was. 
in the drawer of a cupboard in 50 Rizaline Road, Broccoli, SE 26. You'll never need woolens in Africa, my father had said. The movement of the truck had lulled a huge pink-faced idiot from Egham to sleep. When we staged for the night, I woke him up. Where, where are we? He said. Africa, I replied. Oh, he said. I thought it was Egham. What he needed was a direct hit. The Arabs of this village looked better off than the plain Arabs. Two plain Arabs and one with chocolate sauce, please. Battery Diary. February the 11th, 1943. Staged at Beni Mansour. If brevity is the soul of wit, this diary was written by Oscar Wilde. My diary. Found a tree with heavy foliage to keep off the dew. And, if needs be, Oscar Wilde. I placed my bedhead towards the trunk between radiating roots. Radiating out from the tree are Gunners Edgington, Tume, White, Shepherds. Total financial holdings, eight shillings. The night closed in. There was an almighty silence. A distant barking dog became a major sound. The soldiers grew still. There was a loud, painful yell. Ah! Firebug Bennett had dozed off with a cigarette and set himself alight for the umpteenth time. His blankets looked like early piano rolls. Peace was restored, the silence broken only by slow tramping of the picket. Each time he passed, puns from the recumbent soldiers. You'll never get well if you pick it. Or keep going, there's a bowl in the cookhouse for you. He silenced us with one threat. You've had your fun, and I'll have mine tomorrow morning at five o'clock when you will have an accidental rude awakening with my boot up your ass. Somewhere a donkey was braying in the darkness. Coming, mother, said Gunner White. Eight o'clock, February the 11th. Breakfast. What's this? Porridge? It was porridge. Watery grey? Vile, but porridge. So, the porridge convoys were getting through. Now, this was better. This was more like the suffering we're supposed to have in wars. Porridge. We paraded at our vehicles, small arms inspection, check on ammunition, then off again, and porridge. We were climbing steadily all day. Jagged peaks, three and four thousand feet, ranged on either side. From Major Chater Jack's diary of the 12th of February, midday. Very cold just now, as we are high up in the mountains, and I have just halted the column for half an hour. It is still a stiff pull for our vehicles. We climbed up and up, following bend after hairpin bend, through pine woods until we reached the open flat plain between the mountain tops. It is across this plain we are now travelling. Twixt Tizi Uzu and Beni Mansur, we passed mountains each side of 8,000 feet and numerous rock hewn tunnels. Attention, Rolantier, signs appeared frequently. We saw camel trains all laden with goods. They followed the ancient camel tracks two or three hundred feet above us, moving slowly with a dignity no civilization had managed to speed up. At sundown, the Arabs turned towards Mecca to carry out their devotions. A religious people, more than I could say for our lot. The only time they knelt was to pick up money. Hitlergram number 697312. The scene, a glittering affair in the German Naffy. The band under General Glenn von Miller. Hitler. Ach, mine are beautiful. May I have the collapse of Franz Waltz with you? Gunner Milligan, thank you. Hitler, you dance beautifully. But it is not good enough for the Führer. Hitler. Pardon moi, Hitler. This is a Vichy. Excuse me one step. Hitler. Take this old French twit outside and shoot him. Now, what is your name, darling? Gunner Milligan. Gunter Milligan. Where have I heard that name before? Uh, I give up. Where have you heard it before? Hitler. Playing hard to get, Hein. Take this woman out and shoot him.